I, I can't tell you how excited I am being next to Tom Cotton uh, for this hearing because I think as much as uh, Tom Cotton and I have uh, that differs us, uh, we actually both have a lot of the same uh, commitment to community safety, and I think this is a hearing that strikes right to the heart of keeping communities safe and strong. And I'm excited that the two of us are here for this inquiry, really to hear from folks uh, about an issue that is really exciting. There is much made of technology and its influence on our society. When I was mayor of the city of Newark, the number one issue of my constituents, the pollster that I had and never seen anything like it, was the safety and the security of our neighborhoods and communities. And what was exciting for me is that we introduced a lot of technology um, as a mechanism with which to keep people safe. Uh, technology now that some of our witnesses actually can talk to, like uh, shot spotters and uh, cameras and more, license plate readers and more. And what excites me now is uh, I was uh, 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 mayor about 11 years ago, which is a long time when it comes to the advancements of technology and innovation. We know that technology in America has so much promise, and in this sphere, it could do a lot. Many people would be stunned to know that our murder clearance rates in the United States is something where, uh, uh, Chief Aguilar, you can help us be out, but somewhere around 50%. It is, right. ast yeah, it's ast astonishingly, I think that was a hallelujah that he said there, amen, Senator Booker, um, is astonishingly low. And so, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that technology could help us on clearance rates. It could help us to create uh, more community trust. It could help us on investigations. It could help us in so many positive ways. But we also know that technology presents a lot of possibilities to undermine our core values and our ideals as well. When it comes to certain constitutional protections, when it comes to privacy, when it comes to uh, some of the most sacrosanct elements of our democracy. And so we know that AI is consequential in our society as a whole in ways that many of us can't fully imagine, both in the possibility and the promise, as well as the potential problems. When it comes to our criminal justice system, where often a person's liberty and a person's life are at stake, when the safety of their neighborhoods are at stake, uh, where their constitutional protections are at stake is particularly consequential. Law enforcement's use of artificial intelligence technology is not a recent development, again, as one of our, all of our experts can attest to. Its recent expansion raises a lot of questions as well as uh, raises a lot of excitement for me about the possibilities. And so I'm going to submit the rest of my opening testimony um, uh, for the record. Uh, but I do want to say uh, to the witnesses that are here how excited I am. I know you all made sacrifices and took time out. I'm going to introduce you in a moment after uh, my ranking member, Senator Cotton, does his opening statement. Uh, but we really are at a point in humanity where every generation has breakthrough technologies that shape and alter the course of, of humanity. AI is most certainly one of those things. And I know that uh, Senator Cotton and I both are committed to trying to find a way uh, to capture the possibility as well as protect against the risks. And with that, uh, I'm, I'm very excited and very grateful uh, to Senator Cotton and his entire team for helping to make this uh, hearing possible. And I will turn uh, the microphone over to him for his opening remarks. Thank you, Senator Booker. Uh, I will say that artificial intelligence has gained uh, a lot of attention lately, uh, over the last year and a half or so in particular, but the core technology has been around for some time. Um, because of how it's depicted, maybe we start with what it's not. Uh, many people, fortunately most people, don't have much personal interaction with law enforcement or with the criminal justice system. Um, what is AI in law enforcement not, though? It's not RoboCop, it's not the Terminator, it's not the Matrix, it's not Ultron, it's not even Wall-E. Um, it, it is never used independent of human decision-making in our criminal justice system. Um, that's why it's a tool in the law enforcement toolbox, uh, and it can provide impressive time-saving and criminal sol crime-solving and justice-serving tools. Just one example, facial recognition software, for instance, could take a crime scene sketch or a security camera image and go through thousands and thousands of pictures in a public database, say a, a driver's license database. It can eliminate obvious non-matches, it might be even to narrow it down, but then that is a tool that 
independent human judgment can use to pursue leads. Um, if the early stages of a criminal investigation are like looking for a needle in a haystack, then artificial intelligence, if you will, can provide a magnet for some of our criminal uh, investigators in the police forces around the country. Um, that's why I want to enter into the record with consent here a statement from the National Sheriff's Association, major county sheriffs of America, and the major cities chief association. They represent state and local law enforcement all across the country. I want to highlight one particular line from their statement. Quote, it is essential to recognize that our AI powered technology serves as an investigative assistant to law enforcement rather than a replacement for the human element, end quote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask consent to enter that statement into the record. Without objection. Um, I also want to give one concrete real world example of how this can work. Uh, last summer, British authorities uh, contacted the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security about a video of child sexual exploitation. They had reason to believe it was made in the United States. DHS ran the faces against a mass database of photos and they found a match. A college sports administrator in Missouri. Investigators then found the suspect's Facebook profile and were able to confirm not only that it was the same person, but even that the child victim was on his Facebook page. They eventually got a search warrant from a judge, and in July they were able to arrest and charge this predator. Without that facial recognition technology, he might be free today, and that child might still be subjected to abuse today as well. AI-powered law enforcement tools also improve efficiency and save lives in other ways. For instance, by modeling where and when crimes happen, law enforcement agencies can better position limited patrol units to prevent crimes or to respond quickly. They can coordinate with other emergency services like ambulances for better staffing at times and places where they would be needed. Uh, in yet other cases, AI-powered products like those made by Motorola Solutions are used by 911 call centers to clean up, transcribe, and even translate 911 calls in real time. Or an AI product made by the company Axon is used by law enforcement to quickly blur faces and body cam footage so police departments can share the footage with the public faster. Other AI-powered tools can analyze financial records to help identify financial crime, and AI-powered cameras can recognize license plates of wanted individuals and alert law enforcement to investigate. Now, I understand there are some who have concerns about the use of artificial intelligence technology in law enforcement, and those concerns are in some cases valid and should be aired, which I think we'll do today. But I do want to point out that the, probably the most uncomfortable people with the use of artificial intelligence are criminals who would like to avoid being caught. Because again, artificial intelligence is simply a tool that human investigators, police officers, prosecutors can use to help solve cases, convict criminals, and put them behind bars. We need to remember that artificial intelligence powered law enforcement tools are assistive technologies helping law enforcement officers be better at their jobs and responsibly use these technologies can help create a faster, cheaper, more accurate criminal justice system where the criminals are being caught, prosecuted, victims are being provided justice, and the innocent are not being punished. I know our witnesses have thoughts and expertise to share on these questions, and I look forward to today's conversation. I do want to say and apologize in advance that since this hearing was scheduled, the Republican Conference has scheduled an all-Republican meeting about the National Security Supplemental Bill that is currently under debate. So I may not make it to the end, but I assure you it has nothing to do with your testimony. Thank you all. Uh, Senator Cotton, thank you for those excellent remarks. Um, you went through an array of movies there from WALL-E to Terminator. Were those recommendations or, or did your staff sort of put them in? <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I am excited. That what I'm going to do now is introduce all the witnesses and then um, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand up and raise your right hand and, and swear an oath. Uh, we prefer you not to swear at us, but just swear the oath and then we'll go and open it up for your testimony in alphabetical order. Uh, so I want to introduce really quickly the Assistant Chief of Police, Armando Aguilar, uh, from the City of Miami Department uh, and Law Enforcement Subcommittee member of the National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee. Assistant Chief Aguilar is Assistant Chief of Police for the City of Miami Police Department, which is having some extraordinary success in protecting citizens and keeping their community and safe. In 2022, you began serving as a member of the Law Enforcement Subcommittee of the National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, which advises the President of the United States on matters related to the use of AI in law enforcement. As Assistant Chief of Police, you oversee hundreds of sworn uh, and civilian employees, and you've held 
many senior management positions in all divisions of the Miami Police Department. During your time with the MPD, uh, you have implemented off offender-focused strategies that have contributed to significant reductions in violent crime and significant in increases in clearance rates. You hold a master in public administration from Barry University and a bachelor's of uh, criminal justice from St. Leo University. It's really an honor to have you here and, and we're very, very grateful. Um, um, I uh, want to next introduce Dr. Karen Howard, PhD. Uh, 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 Dr. Howard uh, is, works with the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO, as acting chief scientist and a director of the GAO, GAO's Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Team, STAA, or STA, I'm not sure which one, uh, or STA. -A. Uh, you manage a broad portfolio of, of topics, frankly, an impressive portfolio of topics, including forensic algorithms, uh, biological threats, chemical weapons, national security, implications of emerging technologies, and other issues. It's pretty extraordinary, the work you do. You've produced uh, key GAO reports that you're going to testify about, including forensic technology algorithms used in federal law enforcement and forensic technology algorithms strengthen forensic analysis, but several factors can affect outcomes. Uh, you've earned your PhD in environmental chemistry um, and your master's degree in analytical chemistry. Uh, you are, as my dad would say, you have more degrees in the month of July, and it's great to have you here. Um, and thank you for, again, flying up from, from Alabama uh, as well. Uh, it's difficult for me, uh, uh, Professor Wexler, uh, you have so much Berkeley on your resume as a Stanford man, I'm going to try to muscle my way through this, okay? Uh, you are Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Berkeley School of Law and Faculty Co-Director. You're, uh, you're the Co-Director for the Berkeley Center of Law and Technology. Uh, Professor Weckler is a faculty co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology and assistant professor of law at UC Berkeley. Your teaching and research focus on data, technology, and secrecy in, in the criminal legal system. Your scholarship has appeared in so many places, the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, Yale Law Journal Forum, NYU Law Review, UCLA Law Review, Texas Law Review, Vanderbilt Law Review, uh, Berkeley Technology Law Review. I would criticize you because nothing in Arkansas, you need to uh, you need to correct for that. Uh, Professor Weckler served as senior policy advisor for science and justice at the White House Office of Science and Technology during the spring of 2023, and as the James C. Carpenter Visiting Professor at Columbia Law School. You've got your JD from Yale, MPhil from Cambridge uh, as a Gates Scholar, and you are summa cum laude at Harvard. Uh, and again, we thank you for flying in all the way from California. Um, would the three witnesses please stand up and raise your right hand? <coughs> thank you so much, uh, and to our ranking member for hosting such an important conversation. I will um, sort of skip the preface and really jump right into what I think is, is a very important topic to examine. Uh, Dr. Howard, if it's okay, I'll, I'll start with you and I'll, I'll try to land in my constituents uh, uh, basket there. But uh, Dr. Howard, can you you mentioned in the three recommendations that you uh, would, would invite Congress to act in the space of increased transparency. Um, I'd like to, to hear you talk a little bit about what kinds of transparency you think are needed. I, I'm going to direct this, this question to, to Professor Wexler as well, but I'd love to, to start with you uh, and just sort of hear your thoughts there. Certainly, and we, in making our policy options for policymakers, we try not to be too prescriptive. We want to sure. leave room for the policymakers, but some of the things we heard about from experts we spoke with include being transparent about the training databases, for example. How representative are they? Where are they drawn from? Are they representative of the kind of evidence that might be collected at a crime scene, the, the sort of print quality that might be expected or photo quality that might be expected. Also, increased transparency about whether they've been tested and how and what were the results of those tests so that everybody understands how does the algorithm perform under ideal conditions, under less than ideal conditions, which are often present in a criminal investigation, and can then make a determination about how much weight to give the evidence that is produced by the algorithm. I know there are a couple specific areas um, that you also recommend uh, increased transparency. You ended your, your testimony in the space of auditing. What other, what other recommendations would you add there? Thank you for the question. I would add that the right test is the baseline relevance test. So by default, 
criminal defense counsel is entitled to discover relevant evidence on a case-by-case basis. That's the threshold that they should have to show in order to get access to any details about evidence used against their client. What's the problem is when that threshold burden is raised to a necessity burden, for instance, based on some so-called secrecy interest. And the secrecy interest, if it's intellectual property, is not a legitimate one to do that. Hmm. So stay, stay there for just one second, because I did want to um, talk just a little bit about public defenders. Um, and um, we all know, have seen the data, particularly uh, in metropolitan communities around, around the country, the overworked uh, nature uh, and caseload management of, of public defenders. You talk a lot about um, the potential challenges, the, the need for transparency. How, share just a little bit about how the failure to disclose uh, the usage of AI might enter um, the consideration or the management of the case workload for public defenders. Sure. Uh, so I have two thoughts on this. One is uh, that because AI systems are used across many different cases, uh, even if you have a public defender or even private defense counsel who's particularly well-resourced, so say in a centralized office that has enough uh, counsel to have specialized counsel focusing on DNA or other forensic technologies, even if disclosure goes just to, to if it goes to everybody, but those well-resourced counsel are able to identify flaws or weaknesses in the technology, those identifications benefit everyone as a whole. So even though not every council will have the bandwidth to address it, uh, it, disclosure is still beneficial. And I can give a concrete example of where disclosure was beneficial in uh, one case, if that would be helpful. Um, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of New York City created a forensic software program called FST to analyze DNA evidence. And for years, they refused to disclose source code for that tool, claiming they had a trade secret interest in withholding it. In one case, they finally were ordered to disclose by uh, Judge Valerie Caproni, um, former general counsel of the FBI in the Southern District of New York. And the defense expert witness who reviewed it in that case un uncovered a undisclosed function that discarded data in certain circumstances and had been added after the New York State Forensic Science Commission's regulatory approval for the tool. So that discovery uh, happened in an individual case and was beneficial, was useful information for many other defense counsel as well. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Ranking Member Tom Cotton. Mr. Aguilar, you mentioned in your opening testimony that uh, tip lines like Crime Stoppers. Um, you'd also said last year in an interview that uh, your department treats facial recognition technology, quote, like a tip that is called into Crime Stoppers. Do you, is that correct? Do you recall that? Yes, Senator. Um, so in your career as a police officer, have you ever gotten erroneous tips from Crime Stopper hotlines? Uh, at, at least tips that we couldn't corroborate with other evidence. Absolutely, Senator. Okay. Do you, have you ever considered eliminating Crime Stopper hotlines because you get erroneous tips? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, you're not testifying that, say, facial recognition technology or ballistic uh, technology is flawless, are you? I'm not. Okay. Um, let's say that you have facial recognition technology and you run a security camera image through that technology and it gives you back seven potential positives. What's the next steps you take? Do you go out and arrest all seven individuals? Absolutely not, Senator. We would uh, treat the, uh, the matches as if we had just received seven Crime Stoppers tips, and our, our detectives would do their due diligence and, uh, and, and either uh, try to discount or corroborate it with other evidence that could tie that person to the crime scene. Using other technology or even artificial intelligence technology or using traditional gumshoe investigative techniques? All of the above, Senator. This is absolutely not a, a substitute for traditional investigative methods. It, it complements traditional investigative methods, but in no way can AI, at least in my view, substitute uh, traditional methods. Okay. What would be the consequence if you did not have this kind of technology in your department? I am uh, I'm very certain that we would have many more crimes that would go 
uh, not only unsolved, but, uh, but there's, a, there's an additional consequence to having unsolved crimes, and that, that is that those, those criminal suspects are allowed to continue to victimize other people. And so it's not just a, it's not just a lower clearance rate, uh, but it's also, uh, it's also a higher victimization rate. Okay. Ms. Wexler, one of your chief points seems to be that the vendors who provide such technology should be compelled to disclose their source code. Is that correct? If the source code is relevant evidence in a particular case, then that should be the baseline standard and should be disclosed under a protective order that protects the intellectual property interest to the reasonable degree. Could, could you give examples again of when that would be relevant evidence? Because as Mr. Aguilar said, if you get seven positives from facial recognition technology, that itself is not going to be what cinches the case or gets a conviction or perhaps even admitted into crime. That you have these two dueling uh, uh, reactions. One is you see how unfair the criminal justice system is. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a predominantly white area, went to Stanford, Yale, saw lots of drug use the enforcement of which was nil to nothing, but in communities of color that are like mine, you see a tremendous amount of drug use. And then on the flip side, you see all these crimes, as you were eloquently putting, that are going on in your neighborhood that aren't being solved. So you have this almost doubled down uh, 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 discontent with your uh, public safety, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, there's one great um, uh, criminal justice writer that says black communities have uh, too much of the policing they don't want and not enough of the policing that they need um, in terms of, uh, as we said, the closeout rates of murders and shootings and the like. But, it, but your story is extraordinary. So I was so excited that you, you, you came as a witness today because you, you're working so hard to uh, restore that trust within communities. And that technology, and I saw this, where my, the ACLU was dead set against me using uh, a camera technology and shot spotters. We invited them in to help us write the operating procedures. Um, and then how my, much my community wanted this technology being used on their streets because they're like, you don't live here. We want cameras on our streets and the like. So I, I guess this tension that, that, that I've lived my, my life is something you struggle with every day. And technology brings a whole new um, era of challenges to something that's so important for law enforcement, which is police community trust. And so I'm hoping with that context, could you sort of tell me what your hope is amidst this for uh, restoring the kind of trust needed to, to safely, uh, to, for communities to be safe? And then what is the excitement that you have as you see the future of this technology to even better help the most impacted communities uh, uh, have the kind of safety and security every community deserves? So, Senator, to, to your point, absolutely. Um, you know, we know that, at least through my experience, uh, in, in the communities that are, that are the most affected by gun violence, um, I, I have never heard anyone in, in those communities say we need less of this. Um, it, it, they, they want everything that we can, that we can throw at the problem uh, so that their children stop dying, right? That, that's, that's the overriding concern in, in the communities that are most affected by gun violence. And, and so what I found is that these tools uh, have, have helped us hone in on those people are the, that are the drivers of repeat gun violence. We, we know through numerous studies that, uh, that, that it's usually about 5% of our gun offenders that are driving 50% of the shootings. Uh, so AI has given us the, the opportunity, uh, along with traditional uh, policing methods, where we employ micro hotspot policing, where we, uh, where we focus on, on repeat offenders. We saw, for example, uh, a disturbing trend in some domestic homicide cases where those incidents were preceded not by, by felony incidents of domestic violence, but by misdemeanors that perhaps we couldn't get to quick enough. And so we, were, we found a way to identify those people that were repeat offenders for domestic violence that were also carrying out other crimes uh, to where when we're talking about carrying out enforcement that's preventative in nature, we're not targeting entire communities so much as we're targeting those 5% of offenders and 5% of locations that drive 50% of our violent crime. So uh, I, I think that numerous studies have also, also shown that the more, the more police officers we have out there, the more resources, human resources, uh, the, the more positive our impact on crime rates. But it goes beyond that. Where we have to just also embrace a lot of these technologies that help us focus on the right people that are driving violence in our and communities. And technology is clearly a force multiplier. Uh, it allows one individual to do a lot more work a lot more quickly. It, it's, and it, you've been a homicide investigator, so you understand that, yes? It, it can, it, th these technologies can cut out uh, hours, e even weeks worth of, of time 
in, in certain instances uh, where, where we're talking video analytics where, where we can get several weeks worth of, uh, of footage and be able to compress it to, 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 to those points that are most relevant uh, and of evidentiary value, absolutely. And then, and then how do you see, is there anything on the frontiers that gets you really excited about where you think policing might be with these tools in five years, ten years from now? I, I think that um, I, I think that a lot of the technologies, just like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, with ballistic evidence, uh, to where we sometimes have a, a hard time considering that artificial intelligence. A lot of these these technologies are going to become more mainstream. We we use uh, with facial recognition as an example. We use it in our daily lives just to get into our phone several times a day, um, and and so I, I think that. I, I think that the, these technologies hold a great deal of promise. I think that they that they become smarter and more accurate with time. Uh, we just have to uh, put behind it the responsible policy, the the right amount of research. Uh, the, the NIST uh, 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 facial recognition vendor testing, for example, is an excellent resource. If if we were to consider, uh, if, if Congress were to consider federal funding for some of these technologies, uh, compare you know comparing it to. Uh, sources that are available, like the, the NIST vendor testing, will be greatly helpful. What about training and accountability of police officers? I, I mean, I, my police union resisted uh, body cams, and then it shifted really quickly. They, they appreciated them because for citizen complaints, it was, it was a very good video to have. Uh, my former director now thinks body cams is great for that. All that footage is great for training because you can break down officer interactions. I'm imagining that could be done with AI looking at the volumes and hours and hours looking for certain patterns that might help to create more accountable policing. Have you, have you used it all to hold your police to higher levels of accountability and transparency? So, Senator, to, to your first point, uh, there, there's never enough training. And so I, I am always a fan of more and better training. Uh, right now, we are, uh, we are looking into a research partnership uh, that uh, to where we will use artificial intelligence to uh, to go through those hours and weeks worth of body cam footage to not only highlight problematic behavior but also commendable behavior. Yeah, you know, I, I saw uh, I just had a, a sheriff in New Jersey uh, commit suicide. I I have uh, seen officer mental health challenges. I was just talking to a reporter about uh, the Obama's 21st Century Task Force on policing, and they saw a lot of predictive analytics for officer misconduct, one of them which is actually doing suicide calls, seemed to be something that would pop up uh, before an officer would have an interaction with a, a citizen that was negative. And I, and I don't know if that's something you're thinking about, about how to see uh, how AI might be able to help in that space to anticipate officer behavior who might need more training. Without a doubt, Senator, I, th I think that the any technology that will help us flag problematic behavior, uh, we've, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen officers who's, who've, whose careers have come to a very, a very ugly end, right? And, and, and they're often preceded by problematic behavior where uh, that officer could have benefited by, uh, from early intervention. Uh, and so we as a police department can't correct problematic behavior that we're not aware of. And so if this technology helps us get there, uh, I'm, I'm all for it, absolutely. And so I, I, I would imagine, and I'm just, the last question that I'd like to move on to, 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 to Dr. Howard, um, I do hear this, though, still in my community. Um, my, my young kids are, are stopped by uh, and frisked more than any other community. This doesn't happen in wealthier, whiter communities. Uh, now we're under video surveillance in ways that other communities are not. Now they have facial recognition that we're exposed to more than other communities. You can see how that list can go on and on and on and on, which I wonder if people start to feel like they're under a surveillance state or uh, feel like they're having their just basic privacies. Can you, can you empathize with that feeling, or is that just not your experience that you're seeing out there at all? So, Senator, I think that right now video cameras are, are ubiquitous. I, I, I read in one place, I, I can't remember uh, the exact source, but... Uh, the United States is second only to China uh, in terms of the number of video cameras that the average citizen encounters every day. Uh, the difference, of course, being that most of the video cameras that we as Americans encounter are owned by individuals, are, are owned by the private sector. Um, and, and so I think that perhaps in some communities that are more prone to gun violence where some of the cameras belong to law enforcement versus other communities where, uh, where, where they're held by individuals in the private sector, uh, but I, I do think that 
right now being under some form of camera surveillance is, is just an accepted part of life uh, for, for all communities throughout the United States. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Howard, I was really appreciative of your sort of best practices, and they resonated uh, with uh, Dr. Wexler in, in a significant way. And one of the things I think that resonates with uh, 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 Chief Aguilar is just this idea of training. Could you just go another level deeper on that? You said how important it is for analyst training. What does that mean? So we know that in order for these tools to be used properly, the, the analyst decisions before the algorithm comes, comes into play are critical, and the analyst decisions afterwards. So if we think about any one of these, if we think about uh, latent print analysis, for example, just to, to use a different one, the analyst, so somebody in the, in the human chain, collects a fingerprint at a crime scene or from a piece of evidence, processes that fingerprint, scans it, decides whether it's of sufficient quality to even be able to match it to something else or to attempt to link it to somebody else, marks it up or has a computer program mark it up on where are the key features of this fingerprint that might be worth comparing with a database, puts it into the algorithm. All the algorithm is doing is comparing it to a database of prints. There's nothing magical about that. That's been done for decades uh, on, on computers. Before that, on cards stored in files, they would pull out the cards and they would compare each fingerprint. So all the algorithm is doing is speeding up that comparison process. And then at the end, it puts out a candidate list. And that candidate list is nothing more than the top 10, 20, 50, however many the, the program is designed for or however many the analyst has asked for, of the best matching candidates from, from the you know, the best match at the top to the lesser matches as you move down the list. But that doesn't say anything about the strength of the actual evidence. The person at the top of the list might actually be a lousy match, but it's the best match in the database. And that's all the algorithm is able to do. If you have a partial print or a smeared print or one that's distorted, they may not be able to get a very good match. And if, if you were putting a percent match on it, which is not what these algorithms do, but if you were doing that, it might say something like 35% match. And that's your number one candidate. It. Analysts often do not understand that. They often think, this is my number one candidate, or these are my top ten. It's got to be one of these people that came up at the top of the list. And in reality, it might be somebody completely different. All the algorithm can do is find the best matches to whatever quality fingerprint they're given, and it has to be somebody who's already in the database. And obviously, not everybody has their fingerprints in every database that could be used for comparison. So a, a lot of hu human understanding at the beginning about what quality of print is good enough, and human understanding at the end about what do these results really mean. Right, but var variations in training for local police departments could wi train could vary widely and end up with widely different results. That's it, absolutely true. And and so that's why you're, you, you, one of your recommendations is to have uh, have national standards, right? I, we think national standards would help to drive the conversation. If if there were standards at the federal level, or if there were standards that applied to how much is good enough, right? What what quality of print is good enough to put into a latent print algorithm? Some of those kinds of standards could start to bring more consistency to this and help reduce the potential for well-meaning human investigators who are doing their best to solve a crime to be able to use the tools more effectively and interpret the results more efficiently. Right, and how would you feel, is that overly prescriptive for the federal government? Because I, I'm a big believer, having run a local police department, how cash-strapped you are, how you're constantly battling for resources. And so things like COPS grants and other grants for technology are really critical. But how would you feel if those grants came with a requirement for certain standards for your analysts and the like? Is that overly burdensome? Senator, I, I think that uh you know, it, it's a bit of a broad question, but I think that, just generally speaking, a grant that comes with a requirement that that the peop, that the agency receiving the grant properly train uh, to to a particular standard, the the people who are going to be carrying out the function, I, I don't think is overly burdensome. Great, and and so, um, uh, Dr. Howard, last question: When you say increased transparency, are you getting at some of the things that? Professor Wexler is talking about in terms of the need of opening up these algorithms to peer review and to uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of an, more adversarial analysis. So we looked at the criminal investigation portion, which I realize feeds into the courtroom, but we did not look at the courtroom uh, processes that might occur. So I want to set the stage with that. But the experts we spoke with indicated that transparency is critical, both in terms of how the algorithm was built, what if it's an AI-enabled algorithm, what training data were used 
but also then transparency about has it been tested? What, what is the accuracy of this through something like the NIST uh, facial recognition vendor testing? What accuracy was determined through that kind of testing? What demographic bias did this algorithm exhibit through that kind of testing? That can be very useful information, and our experts were very much in favor of that. Opening the source code, though, our experts told us is not necessary. It is a path to figuring out how the algorithm works. It is not the only path in the view of the experts we spoke with. Independent third-party testing can accomplish many of the same things. And you, and you guys noted in your report that there was a lack of independent, um, uh, uh, a lack of sufficient independent validation. Is that, could you? Th that is often true, yes. The, the NIST tests, which are top of the line gold standard testing, they are done only if a vendor chooses to submit its algorithm for testing. And, There's no requirement for a vendor to And you're saying to, to so right now the DOJ um, it, it, there, there's a lack, in, in the DOJ's engagement of this technology right now, there's a lack of sufficient independent uh, sort of um, oversight. So we didn't look at the, at the DOJ in, in depth in terms of how they validate their algorithms. We did talk to a number of officials at FBI, and they told us, and, and I believe this is in our report, that they worked with NIST to develop a validation protocol that they then run in-house. But you haven't so evaluated that? We have not evaluated it, no. That was not part of the scope of our work. It's and work we could do if there was interest. And, and well, I have interest, but I, I can't speak for the DOJ. But but you're, when you if you were to be called upon to do that analysis, one of the things you would be looking at is sort of an independent, objective review, uh, a sufficient review of of algorithms of the technology itself. Correct. Of the algorithm accuracy, demographic bias, features like that. And what's the danger of perhaps them not having done that? Right now. Then they, may, they might, may not know how effectively their algorithm works, and they may not know that the candidate list they get out could be skewed by, for example, biased training data that the algorithm was trained on. They just may not be aware of that if they haven't run that. I mean, should set, that set off alarms? Should I be writing to the DOJ and saying, look, I have legitimate concerns that you have not tested this uh, uh, in a sufficient way? I, I would say any law enforcement entity that's using an algorithm that has not been validated in, in a form that would be considered defensible should set off alarms, absolutely. Okay. And then finally, uh, let's, well, sorry, again, you traveled the farthest, um, and I'm grateful. Um, but I, I, I do wonder, you, you obviously have a lot of concerns in your testimony, um, but there are also protections that AI tools could use. Um, I always think of these waves of technology as potentially democratizing, because you talked about the possible expense of a defense attorney in a situation, but AI might be a tool that defense attorneys could use uh, to help out. Do you, does your, you've done a lot of writing and, and obviously sit w w with the technology group at, 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 at Bolt. Are there some things that give you hope when you look at this technology that you might want to put into the record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, to be clear, my concerns are, are neutral about the technology itself. I think AI technologies have potential to increase accuracy and efficacy of law enforcement investigations and prosecutions and uh, also have the potential to help criminal defense investigators identify evidence of innocence. So the, the technologies themselves are not the issue. It's the legal rules that we set up around them to help us ensure that they are the best, most accurate and effective tools and not uh, flawed or fraudulent in some way. Um, I, I just want to say, it, it, before I give my sort of closing remarks, uh, number one, I'm just so grateful to Senator Cotton uh, with a lot of demands uh, given uh, some of the international issues that are going on for him to be here and give such, I thought, a really in important line of questioning. Uh, his partnership is extraordinary. Um, but I want to thank the three witnesses. It's, it is a frontier that we have uh, that I think it's dis difficult to anticipate where we will be in five years from now, and, and, and this technology is really accelerating. The challenge for government and, and I've seen this in waves of innovation, is that we have not moved as fast as the uh, innovations around us. And I've seen this in nuclear energy. I've seen this in drone technology. Government has not been able to keep up maybe a platform uh, of, of the substantive accord that we have in a bipartisan way on some of the challenges with uh, social media, for example, is, is a, another great example. You all are on the cutting edge of looking at this, and, and it's exciting to me uh, not only to hear your testimony, but to hear... Uh, what some common sense precautions could be uh, that, uh, from on a federal level, as well as ways to try to figure out how to advance the technology to the greatest aims of humanity, which is um, 
a democratic system that protects the rights of all individuals, including rights to privacy, as well as what I think is a fundamental human right or uh, a freedom that we should have, which is a freedom from fear, a freedom from uh, the kind of uh, depraved criminality that we often see manifesting in communities um, as well. So this testimony has been rich, uh, both your written testimony and your verbal testimony. Uh, it gives me a lot of gratitude. I know that Congress as a whole is looking at AI from every different perspective. This is, for what I know of, the first hearing in the Senate that really is focusing in on its effect in the criminal justice system. My hope is that you all will, will be available uh, in the future to consulting with us. There may be some uh, potential for some great bipartisan ideas uh, to come out of this, or at the very least, uh, uh, opening up conversations with some of the key actors in law enforcement on the federal level. Um, I cannot uh, tell you, Chief Aguilar, as a guy who lives in a community um, that has struggled with a lot of the issues that yours has, uh, the heroic work that you're doing uh, every single day. It's just something that uh, uh, means a lot to me, and I look forward to visiting it, uh, hopefully. Um, and the truth of the matter is um, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we'll be confused for each other because we're both, uh, you know, have similar haircuts, but I'm hoping that uh, that, won't, that, won't, that won't be the case. Um, but uh, I, I want to remind uh, everyone that the uh, subcommittee uh, that questions for the record um, are due a week uh, from today, uh, Wednesday, January 31st at 5.30 p.m. And I hope that should there be questions, because again, the senators have been pulled in so many different directions. Um, uh, my ranking member's team might have some questions for the record as well. I hope that you all, uh, after all the sacrifice you made getting here, uh, preparing written testimony and testifying, that you will still be able to respond in a timely fa fashion to any questions uh, that, that, are, that are sent to you. Um, when you testify before the United States Senate, it, I, 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 uh, I know how important that is. It may seem uh, like a small committee, subcommittee here in crime, that you have these two dueling uh, uh, reactions. One is you see how unfair the criminal justice system is. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a predominantly white area, went to Stanford, Yale, saw lots of drug use, the enforcement of which was nil to nothing, but in communities of color that are like mine, you see a tremendous amount of drug use. And then on the flip side, you see all these crimes, as you were eloquently putting, that are going on in your neighborhood that aren't being solved. So you have this almost doubled down uh, uh, d uh, discontent with your uh, public safety uh, and that's a problem. Uh, there's one great um, uh, criminal justice writer that says black communities have uh, too much of the policing they don't want and not enough of the policing that they need um, in terms of, uh, as we said, the closeout rates of murders and shootings and the like. But, it, but your story is extraordinary. So I was so excited that you, you, you came as a witness today because you, you're working so hard to uh, restore that trust within communities. And that technology, and I saw this, where my, the ACLU was dead set against me using uh, a camera technology and shot spotters. We invited them in to help us write the operating procedures. Um, and then how my, much my community wanted this technology being used on their streets, because like, you don't live here, we want cameras on our streets and the like. So I, I guess this tension that, that, that I've lived my, my life is something you struggle with every day, and technology brings a whole new um, era of challenges to something that's so important for law enforcement, which is police community trust. And so I'm hoping with that context, could you sort of tell me what your hope is amidst this for uh, restoring the kind of trust needed to, to safely, uh, to, for communities to be safe? And then what is the excitement that you have as you see the future of this technology to even better help the most impacted communities uh, uh, have the kind of safety and security every community deserves? So, Senator, to, to your point, absolutely. Um, you know, we know that, at least through my experience, uh, in, in the communities that are, that are the most affected by gun violence, um, I, I have never heard anyone in, in those communities say, we need less of this. Um, it, they, they want everything that we can, that we can throw at the problem uh, so that their children stop dying, right? That, that's, that's the overriding concern in, in the communities that are most affected by gun violence. And, and so what I found is that these tools uh, have, have helped us hone in on those people are the, that are the drivers of repeat gun violence. We, we know through numerous studies that, uh, that, that it's usually about 5% of our gun offenders that are driving 50% of the shootings. Uh, so 
AI has given us the, the opportunity, uh, along with traditional uh, policing methods, where we employ micro hotspot policing, where we, uh, where we focus on, on repeat offenders. We saw, for example, uh, a disturbing trend in some domestic homicide cases where those incidents were preceded not by, by felony incidents of domestic violence, but by misdemeanors that perhaps we couldn't get to quick enough. And so we, were, we found a way to identify those people that were repeat offenders for domestic violence that were also carrying out other crimes uh, to where when we're talking about carrying out enforcement that's preventative in nature, we're not targeting entire communities so much as we're targeting those 5% of offenders and 5% of locations that drive 50% of our violent crime. So uh, I, I think that numerous studies have also, also shown that the more, the more police officers we have out there, the more resources, human resources, uh, the, the more positive our impact on crime rates. But it goes beyond that. Where we have to just also embrace a lot of these technologies that help us focus on the right people that are driving violence in our and, communities. And technology is clearly a force multiplier. Uh, it allows one individual to do a lot more work a lot more quickly. It's, and you've been a homicide investigator, so you understand that, yes? It, it can, it, these technologies can cut out uh, hours, e even weeks worth of, of time in, in certain instances uh, where, where we're talking video analytics where, where we can get several weeks worth of, uh, of footage and be able to compress it to, 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 to those points that are most relevant uh, and of evidentiary value, absolutely. And then, and then how do you see, is there anything on the frontiers that gets you really excited about where you think policing might be with these tools in five years, 10 years from now? I, I, think, that, um, I, I think that a lot of the technologies, just like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, with ballistic evidence uh, to where we sometimes have a, a hard time considering that artificial intelligence. A lot of these, these technologies are going to become more mainstream. We, we use, uh, with facial recognition as an example, we use it in our daily lives just to get into our phone several times a day. Um, and, and so I, I think that, I, I think that the, these technologies hold a great deal of promise. I think that they, that they become smarter and more accurate with time. Uh, we just have to uh, put behind it the responsible policy, the, the right amount of research, uh, the, the NIST uh, 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 facial recognition vendor testing, for example, is an excellent resource. If, if we were to consider, uh, if, if Congress were to consider federal funding for some of these technologies, uh, compare, you know, comparing it to uh, sources that are available like the, the NIST vendor testing will be greatly helpful. What about training and accountability of police officers? I, I mean, I, my police union resisted uh, body cams, and then it shifted really quickly. They, they appreciated them because for citizen complaints, it was, it was a very good video to have. Uh, my former director now thinks body cams is great for that. All that footage is great for training because you can break down officer interactions. I'm imagining that could be done with AI looking at the volumes and hours and hours looking for certain patterns that might help to create more accountable policing. Have you, have you used it all to hold your police to higher levels of accountability and transparency? So, Senator, to, to your first point, uh, there, there's never enough training. And so I, I am always a fan of more and better training. Uh, right now, we are, uh, we are looking into a research partnership uh, that uh, to where we will use artificial intelligence to uh, to go through those hours and weeks worth of body cam footage to not only highlight problematic behavior but also commendable behavior. Yeah, you know, I, I saw uh, I just had a, a sheriff in New Jersey uh, commit suicide. I I have uh, seen officer mental health challenges. I was just talking to a reporter about uh, the Obama's 21st Century Task Force on policing, and they saw a lot of predictive analytics for officer misconduct, one of them which is actually doing suicide calls, seemed to be something that would pop up uh, before an officer would have an interaction with a, a citizen that was negative. And I, and I don't know if that's something you're thinking about, about how to see uh, how AI might be able to help in that space to anticipate officer behavior who might need more training. Without a doubt, Senator, I, th I think that the any technology that will help us flag problematic behavior, uh, we've, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen officers who's, who've, whose careers have come to a very, a very ugly end, right? And, and, and they're often preceded by problematic behavior where uh, that officer could have benefited by, uh, from early intervention. Uh, and so we as a police department can't correct problematic behavior that we're not aware of. And so if this technology helps us get there, uh, I'm, I'm all for it, absolutely. And so I, I, 
I would imagine, and I'm just the last question, and I'd like to move on to, 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 to Dr. Howard. Um, I do hear this, though, still in my community. Um, my, my young kids are, are stopped by uh, and frisked more than any other community. This doesn't happen in wealthier, whiter communities. Uh, now we're under video surveillance in ways that other communities are not. Now they have facial recognition that we're exposed to more than other communities. You can see how that list can go on and on and on and on, which I wonder if people start to feel like they're under a surveillance state or uh, feel like they're having their just basic privacies. Can you, can you empathize with that feeling or is that just not your experience that you're seeing out there at all? So Senator, I think that right now video cameras are, are ubiquitous. I, I, I read in one place, I, I can't remember uh, the exact source, but uh, the United States is second only to China uh, in terms of the number of video cameras that the average citizen encounters every day. Uh, the difference, of course, being that most of the video cameras that we as Americans encounter are owned by individuals, are, are owned by the private sector. Um, and, and so I think that perhaps in some communities that are more prone to gun violence where some of the cameras belong to law enforcement versus other communities where, uh, where, where they're held by individuals in the private sector, uh, but I, I do think that right now being under some form of camera surveillance is, is just an accepted part of life uh, for, for all communities throughout the United States. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Howard, I was really appreciative of your sort of best practices, and they resonated uh, with uh, Dr. Wexler in, in a significant way. And one of the things I think that resonates with uh, 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 Chief Aguilar is just this idea of training. Could you just go another level deeper on that? You said how important it is for analyst training. What does that mean? So we know that in order for these tools to be used properly, the, the analyst decisions before the algorithm comes, comes into play are critical and the analyst decisions afterwards. So if we think about any one of these, if we think about uh, latent print analysis, for example, just to, to use a different one, the analyst, so somebody in the, in the human chain, collects a fingerprint at a crime scene or from a piece of evidence processes that fingerprint, scans it, decides whether it's of sufficient quality to even be able to match it to something else or to attempt to link it to somebody else, marks it up or has a computer program mark it up on where are the key features of this fingerprint that might be worth comparing with a database, puts it into the algorithm. All the algorithm is doing is comparing it to a database of prints. There's nothing magical about that. That's been done for decades uh, on, on computers. Before that, on cards stored in files, they would pull out the cards and they would compare each fingerprint. So all the algorithm is doing is speeding up that comparison process. And then at the end, it puts out a candidate list. And that candidate list is nothing more than the top 10, 20, 50, however many the, the program is designed for or however many the analyst has asked for, of the best matching candidates from, from the you know, the best match at the top to the lesser matches as you move down the list. But that doesn't say anything about the strength of the actual evidence. The person at the top of the list might actually be a lousy match, but it's the best match in the database. And that's all the algorithm is able to do. If you have a partial print or a smeared print or one that's distorted, they may not be able to get a very good match. And if, if you were putting a percent match on it, which is not what these algorithms do, but if you were doing that, it might say something like 35% match. And that's your number one candidate. It. Analysts often do not understand that. They often think, this is my number one candidate, or these are my top ten. It's got to be one of these people that came up at the top of the list. And in reality, it might be somebody completely different. All the algorithm can do is find the best matches to whatever quality fingerprint they're given, and it has to be somebody who's already in the database. And obviously, not everybody has their fingerprints in every database that could be used for comparison. So a, a lot of hu human understanding at the beginning about what quality of print is good enough, and human understanding at the end about what do these results really mean. Right, but vari variations in training for local police departments could train could vary widely and end up with widely different results. That's it, absolutely true. And and so that's why you're, you, you, one of your recommendations is to have uh, have national standards, right? I, we think national standards would help to drive the conversation. If if there were standards at the federal level, or if there were standards that applied to how much is good enough, right? What what quality of print is good enough to put into a latent print algorithm? Some of those kinds of standards could start to bring more consistency to this and help reduce the potential for well-meaning human investigators who are doing their best to solve a crime to be able to use the tools more effectively and interpret the results more efficiently. Right, and how would you feel, is that overly prescriptive for the federal government because I, I'm a big believer having run a local police department, 
how cash strapped you are, how you're constantly battling for resources. And so things like COPS grants and other grants for technology are really critical. But how would you feel if those grants came with a requirement for certain standards for your analysts and the like? Is that overly burdensome? Senator, I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a broad question, but I think that just generally speaking, a grant that comes with a requirement that that the peop that the agency receiving the grant properly train uh, to to a particular standard, the the people who are going to be carrying out the function, I, I don't think is overly burdensome. Great, and and so, um, uh, Dr. Howard, last question: When you say increased transparency, are you getting at some of the things that Professor Wexler is talking about in terms of the need of opening up these algorithms to peer review and to uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of an, more adversarial analysis? So we looked at the criminal investigation portion, which I realize feeds into the courtroom, but we did not look at the courtroom uh, processes that might occur. So I want to set the stage with that. But the experts we spoke with indicated that transparency is critical, both in terms of how the algorithm was built, what if it's an AI-enabled algorithm, what training data were used, but also then transparency about has it been tested? What, what is the accuracy of this through something like the NIST uh, facial recognition vendor testing? What accuracy was determined through that kind of testing? What demographic bias did this algorithm exhibit through that kind of testing? That can be very useful information, and our experts were very much in favor of that. Opening the source code, though, our experts told us, is not necessary. It is a path to figuring out how the algorithm works. It is not the only path in the view of the experts we spoke with. Independent third-party testing can accomplish many of the same things. And you, and you guys noted in your report that there was a lack of independent, um, uh, uh, a lack of sufficient independent validation. Is that... That, that is often true, yes. The, the NIST tests, which are top-of-the-line gold standard testing, they are done only if a vendor chooses to submit its algorithm for testing. And, There's no requirement for a vendor to, to so do that. And you're saying right now the DOJ... Um, it, it, there's a lack, in, in the DOJ's engagement of this technology right now, there's a lack of sufficient independent uh, sort of um, oversight. So we didn't look at the, at the DOJ in, in depth in terms of how they validate their algorithms. We did talk to a number of officials at FBI, and they told us, and, and I believe this is in our report, that they worked with NIST to develop a validation protocol that they then run in-house. But you haven't so evaluated that? We have not evaluated it, no. That was not part of the scope of our work. It's work we your, could do if there was interest. And, and it, well, I, I have interest, but I, I can't speak for the DOJ. But but you're, when you if you were to be called upon to do that analysis, one of the things you would be looking at is sort of an independent, objective review, uh, a sufficient review of of algorithms of the technology itself. Correct. Of the algorithm accuracy, demographic bias, features like that. And what's the danger of perhaps them not having done that? Right now. Then they, may, they might, may not know how effectively their algorithm works, and they may not know that the candidate list they get out could be skewed by, for example, biased training data that the algorithm was trained on. They just may not be aware of that if they haven't run that. I mean, should set, that set off testing. alarms? Should I be writing to the DOJ and saying, look, I have legitimate concerns that you have not tested this uh, uh, in a sufficient way? I, I would say any law enforcement entity that's using an algorithm that has not been validated in, in a form that would be considered defensible should set off alarms, absolutely. Okay. And then finally, uh, Ms. Wexler, again, you traveled the farthest, um, and I'm grateful. Um, but I, I, I do wonder, you, you obviously have a lot of concerns in your testimony, um, but there are also protections that AI tools could use. Um, I always think of these waves of technology as potentially democratizing, because you talked about the possible expense of a defense attorney in a situation, but AI might be a tool that defense attorneys could use uh, to help out. Do you, does your, you've done a lot of writing and, and obviously sit w w with the technology group at, 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 at Bolt. Are there some things that give you hope when you look at this technology that you might want to put into the record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, to be clear, my concerns are, are neutral about the technology itself. I think AI technologies have potential to increase accuracy and efficacy of law enforcement investigations and prosecutions and uh, also have the potential to help criminal defense investigators identify evidence of innocence. So the, the technologies themselves are not the issue. It's the legal rules that we set up around them to help us ensure that they are the best, most accurate and effective tools and not uh, flawed or fraudulent in some way. Um, 
I, I just want to say, it, it, before I give my sort of closing remarks, uh, number one, I'm just so grateful to Senator Cotton uh, with a lot of demands, uh, given uh, some of the international issues that are going on for him to be here and give such, I thought, a really in, important line of questioning. Uh, his partnership is extraordinary. Um, but I want to thank the three witnesses. It's, it is a frontier that we have uh, that I think it's dis difficult to anticipate where we will be in five years from now, and, and, and this technology is really accelerating. The challenge for government, and, and I've seen this in waves of innovation, is that we have not moved as fast as the uh, innovations around us. And I've seen this in nuclear energy, I've seen this in drone technology, government has not been able to keep up maybe a platform uh, of, of the substantive accord that we have in a bipartisan way on some of the challenges with uh, social media, for example, is, is a, another great example. You all are on the cutting edge of looking at this, and, and it's exciting to me uh, not only to hear your testimony, but to hear uh, what some common sense precautions could be uh, that, uh, from, on a federal level, as well as ways to try to figure out how to advance the technology to the greatest aims of humanity, which is um, a democratic system that protects the rights of all individuals, including rights to privacy, as well as what I think is a fundamental human right or uh, a freedom that we should have, which is a freedom from fear, a freedom from uh, the kind of uh, depraved criminality that we often see manifesting in communities um, as well. So this testimony has been rich, uh, they're both your written testimony and your verbal testimony. Uh, it gives me a lot of gratitude. I know that Congress as a whole is looking at AI from every different perspective. This is, from what I know of, the first hearing in the Senate that really is focusing in on its effect in the criminal justice system. My hope is that you all will, will be available uh, in the future to consulting with us. There may be some uh, potential for some great bipartisan ideas uh, to come out of this, or at the very least, uh, uh, opening up conversations with some of the key actors in law enforcement on the federal level. Um, I cannot uh, tell you, Chief Aguilar, as a guy who lives in a community um, that has struggled with a lot of the issues that yours has, uh, the heroic work that you're doing uh, every single day. It's just something that... Uh, uh, means a lot to me, and I look forward to visiting it, uh, hopefully. Um, and the truth of the matter is, um, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we'll be confused for each other, because we're both, uh, you know, have similar haircuts, but I'm hoping that uh, that, won't, that, won't, that won't be the case. Um, but uh, I, I want to remind uh, everyone that the uh, subcommittee, uh, that questions for the record um, are due a week uh, from today. Uh, Wednesday, January 31st at 5.30 p.m. And I hope that should there be questions, because again, the senators have been pulled in so many different directions. Um, uh, my ranking members team might have some questions for the record as well. I hope that you all, uh, after all the sacrifice you made getting here, uh, preparing written testimony and testifying, that you will still be able to respond in a timely fa fashion to any questions uh, that, that, are, that are sent to you. Um, when you testify before the United States Senate, it, I, 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 I uh, I know how important that is. It may seem uh, like a small committee, subcommittee hearing.